Okay, everyone. Hey, Rick Klein, how are you, my friend? I'm very well, Angela. How are you? I'm doing great. It's so good to see your smiling face. Good to, am I smiling? Good to see you too. I, I, yeah, I'm going to try to get my face off of there as soon as possible. Oh, come on now. <laughs> You've been doing okay? Much better than I deserve. Oh, I miss seeing you guys all the time. Miss seeing you. What are you up to? I'm working for Premier Networks now. It's a local IT company. Oh, cool. Yeah, totally different world. <laughs> well, sometimes it's good to mix it up. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome to your November 30th uh, Cornerstone of Augusta meeting. We are going to begin with the pledge. And like we did last time, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute. And then I have this wonderful flag behind me. I'm actually going to stand to move out of the way. Um, to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone is willing to go ahead um, and unmute, do that. And then I'm going to stand up and we're going to do our Pledge of Allegiance. Okay? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States, States of America, America. and to the Republic, Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, one nation under, under God, God. indivisible, indivisible. indivisible. Okay, now um, we are going to have our presentation from the Charitable Trust um, Committee, and that's going to be Chip Madsen. But before Chip talks, I'm going to play um, a video that Angela um, created for one of our Charitable Trust um, recipients. Ron Skeens, the Director of Communications and Development at Christ Community Health Services, and I just want to thank the Kiwanis Club for your support of Christ Community and the many other organizations that you support within our area. Christ Community provides affordable medical and dental care to families all across the CSRA who do not have insurance. And what a family pays for medical or dental visit without insurance is based on their income. When you're supporting Christ Community Health, you're helping us bridge the gap between what an uninsured family pays on their discount and the cost that it actually costs us to provide those services. So you are helping families all across the CSRA get medical and dental care that they could not otherwise afford. And when you're supporting the Kiwanis Trust, you're supporting organizations all across this community who are helping families get the services and the goods that they need. So thank you for your support of Christ Community and the many organizations that you're supporting all across our community and the great work that you're doing at Kiwanis. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Chip to give a report from the committee. Thanks, Martha. I want to thank Angela for the help with that video, too. She's been very helpful to get that set up for us. Uh, as he said, that's Ron Skanes with Christ Community Health Services. He did a great job explaining how his organization benefited from our grant. We gave Christ Community Health $1,500 last year to help provide health care services to those without health insurance. We also awarded $1,500 to five other organizations last year, including the CSRA Humane Society, Historic Augusta, the Lydia Project, the Druid Park Clinic, and the University Hospital Speech and Hearing Center. These are all wonderful organizations that definitely need our help. So we want to do that again this year, not the same organizations, but new ones. And we're asking that all our members contribute at least $100 towards the charitable trust this year. That's $100 from 100% of our members. Remember, we're saving quite a bit on our dues this year, so hopefully some of that savings can be redirected towards the charitable trust and contributions are tax deductible. Your support for the Kiwanis Charitable Trust allows our club to help others in the community that are less fortunate. This year, more than ever, we need to step up to do that. All of the organizations that are chosen for funding are local 501c3 nonprofits 
that have not received funding in the prior year. So all of our grants benefit the local community. The members of the Charitable Trust Committee have all committed to contributing at least $100 each, as has all of our board members and officers. So please send your check to the Qantas Club of Augusta, P.O. Box 102, Augusta, Georgia, 30903, and designate the Charitable Trust or the Scholarship Fund. You may also contribute directly from a retirement account to the Charitable Trust. If you're interested in doing that, please contact the folks at the CSRA Community Foundation, and they can help you do that. All this information will be in the quad notes, so you don't have to remember it from today. Thank you for your support. Okay, thank you, Chip. Um, I do want to say, um, if you read my email on Friday, we are behind on um, our donations for this year. I think that's because we're not physically meeting. Um, so we want to make sure everyone is um, contributing. Uh, we're asking for, you know, $100 from 100%. And right now we're just under about 10% of members who've donated. So we only have like 17 so far. And so um, we really need to bump that up. Uh, and um, tomorrow we are going to be sending out an email um, on Giving Tuesday and um, having the opportunity to donate electronically if that works better for people. So um, just bear that in mind. I also want to remind you that the board has approved a permanent um, scholarship um, in the name of our late member, Sam Tyson. And um, those donations have to be mailed directly to the CSR found, CSRSA Foundation. And that uh, address um, will be in uh, the uh, coordinates as well. Okay, so moving on to our history lesson. Um, on this day in history, November 30th, 1782, the preliminary treaty, treatise of Paris, treaty of Paris was signed, bringing the hostilities of the American Revolution to a close. The United States was prevented from dealing directly with Great Britain due to its alliance with France, having promised that it would not negotiate with Britain without them. Nonetheless, messages were exchanged between Ben Franklin in Paris and Prime Minister Lord Shelburne's Peace Commissioner in Paris, Richard Oswald, seeking common ground on which a preliminary peace could be formed. The United States demanded full recognition by Britain as a sovereign nation, the removal of British troops from its territory, and fishing rights off Newfoundland. At first, Britain wanted the United States to remain a part of Britain's possessions, but with greater autonomy. This was rejected by Ben Franklin, who wanted all of Canada and the United States as part of the deal. Britain rejected this proposal. The negotiations continued in secret and John Jay and John Adams joined Franklin. Due to the exposure of some secret meetings between Britain and France, and due to his distrust of the French, John Jay began negotiating directly with the British against the wishes of Franklin and unbeknownst to France. Formal talks began in September and the remaining difficulties were ironed out in the next two months. Two days after America's fourth peace commissioner, Henry Lawrence arrived, a preliminary agreement was signed on November 30th, 1782, which recognized the United States and established its boundaries, roughly being from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, from the Great Lakes to Florida. The preliminary treaty, treatise, treaty of Paris also granted the U.S. the right to fish off Newfoundland and granted both Britain and the United States the right to use the Mississippi River. Congress was earnestly recommended to the states that they refund any property taken from the Loyalists during the war and creditors on both sides were given full property rights to recover all debts. Prisoners were released from both sides and all American property was left undamaged by British troops when they left. The preliminary Treaty of Paris was ratified by Parliament on January 20th, 1783, and by Congress on April 15th. A ceasefire was declared by Britain on February 4th and by America on April 11th. The official treaty was signed by commissioners on September 3rd, 1783, ratified by Congress on January 14th, 1784, and by Great Britain on April 9th, 1784, and then the ratified documents were exchanged once and for all in Paris on May 12th, 1784, bringing the American Revolution to an end. So even at our nation's founding, it took our government forever to do anything, right? It took 18 months from that first treaty to the, um, official end to the American Revolution. Okay, as promised, we are gonna have our attendance prize today. 
We're doing um, a $15 uh, gift card to Toast Wine and Beverage, and I will mail it out to the winner. And Britt, I forgot to tell you this, but I need you to pick um, a number, your favorite number between one and 16. Now? Yes. Seven. Okay. So I'm going to count up from the bottom this time. One, two, three, four, five, six. Jeff Drake, you have won the attendance prize. So I will be um, getting that out in the mail to you. We, when we meet in person, we do a bottle of wine, but because we can't actually do that um, online, what we'll do is send you that gift card so you can pick out your own bottle of wine or if you prefer a six pack of beer, et cetera. So um, at that, I will go ahead and turn over our program to Troy to introduce our speaker, Brent Klein. Brent is a professional photographer. He's been a professional photographer for over 20 years. His office is over in Aiken. Uh, he grew up, he was born in Florida, but he grew up in Aiken and Asheville, North Carolina. And he's a 1994 graduate of the University of South Carolina where he studied biology and philosophy. But really Brent's professional uh, story begins really at childhood. And, and he recalls that and when his friends had posters on their walls of sports stars and movie stars, uh, Brent had posters of ad campaigns. Those were the things that interested him. Uh, he had pictures of, uh, of Learjet ad, uh, Porsche ads, boat ads. And even as a child, those were the things that, that really interested him. Uh, and those childhood interests really have uh, allowed him to lead what I, I believe to be a, a pretty interesting life up to now. Uh, Brent's been able to go all over the world, all over the country. He shot ad campaigns for Easy Go Golf Carts at about every major golf course in the country. He's been all over the world, Norway, Italy, Germany, India, uh, photographing different subjects and uh, compiling different ad campaigns for different companies. He's had the opportunity to meet and photograph some of the world's greatest musicians, some of the world's greatest athletes, Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, just to name a few. And as he puts it, his work has taken him to some of the most desperate spots on the earth. He's worked on an anti-human trafficking campaign, an anti-human trafficking campaign uh, and a human rights campaign in Pakistan and in Somalia. So Brent's really been able to go a lot of places, see a lot of things, and meet a lot of interesting people as, as part of his work. Kind of describe what he does and the value of what he does. Brent would say that advertising gives people information and different perspectives, and it can change people's minds. It can make them want the things that I think they should want, uh, which is an interesting way to look at advertising. And so we at the Kiwanis Club are very fortunate to have Brent with us today and uh, looking forward to his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Troy. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to switch. I'm going to share my screen now. I've got a little slideshow. What I'd like to do with the time that I have um, is kind of give you some of my favorite photographic quotes from some of my favorite photographers and kind of apply them to your photography. Um, you know, what maybe tips that I would give, assuming I have the right to give any tips on photography. Uh, so right now I'm gonna get off of my face and show you this uh, presentation. All right, can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Cool. All right, my name is Brent Klein. I'm a photographer. Um, and I will start very selfishly with a quote from, um, hang on, if I can go, here we go. From me, uh, figure out what you love to do and then find somebody to pay you to do it. Um, my dad says that I said that when I was 16 years old and he thought I was being a punk kid and he came back later and said, I'll be doggone if you didn't do that actual thing. So um, I have managed to find out what it is I love um, and I have been blessed with the people who actually, love the things that I love, um, I love travel, uh, kind of where I can go. I love uh, cars, a real kind of issue with cars. Um, I love driving cars fast. And I love, again, travel and meeting cultures and understanding cultures. 
And uh, photography's given me the chance to not only travel to these places, but to tell the stories of the people who live in those places. Um, and it says my internet connection is unstable, so bear with me if I disappear. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I've met some amazing and powerful people and some not so amazing and powerful people. Uh, this is me shooting uh, Fashion Week in New York. Um, and uh, that brings me to my next quote, a guy named Chase Jarvis. Uh, he said, the best camera in the world is the one you have with you. Everybody likes, I like to buy the newest and greatest cameras that I can afford. Um, but the true uh, thing about photography is the best camera is the one you'll use and the one you have with you. And he believed this statement so much that he actually wrote a book uh, entirely comprised of iPhone photos. Uh, so this is a professional photographer who shoots for REI and a bunch of brands that you've heard of, uh, very high-end photographer, but his book that he released was actually all iPhone photos. And if I'm being honest, really, look how much, look at the difference in the size of the cameras that we use. This is my friend Ray Santana. He's a celebrity wedding photographer from Miami, but this is when we were shooting Fashion Week together in New York. But you see my big giant Nikon and his iPhone, and honestly, which camera would you use more often? Um, and if I'm being completely honest, look how ridiculous you look trying to make a selfie with a giant Nikon camera. I mean, it's really, really maybe not the most usable camera in all situations. And my favorite photos are actually iPhone photos. Um, this is my family. This is me and my daughter, uh, also an iPhone photo. This is uh, from a birthday party, another iPhone photo, one of my favorite photos. It's not always an iPhone though. I happened to be on a beach during a wedding uh, with my old Mamiya and a Polaroid. And one of the wedding, uh, I, his wife had a, a beautiful tattoo on her back and I commented on it and he said, well, wait till you see mine. And he ripped his shirt open kind of spontaneously. And I happened to have this old Polaroid camera and I snapped a shot. Again, it's one of my favorite pictures. It just happened to be the camera I had with me at the time. The point of that is, is you know, imagery making pictures is not about the tools that you have. It's about taking the tools that you have, not the tools that you want, but it's about taking the tools that you have and making images. Joe McNally says, and I believe he's quoting another photographer, but I read it in his book. So he says, if you want your pictures to be better, stand in front of more interesting stuff. It's very easy. Um, you know, there, you can make artistic shots of, about anything, but if you want pictures to really resonate, try to stand in front of more interesting stuff. And that also includes travel. This is Norway, um, a cow that was more interested in me than I thought he should be, but it was, turned out to be a nice little composition. Uh, this, ironically, is the print that I've sold more than anything else I've ever taken. I did, for some reason, it's really resonated with people that like cows, and so this one picture of Norway is interesting in that regard. I alluded to earlier, I do shoot a lot for Easy Go, and this was Pebble Beach, and then a wonderful man named RJ that was the manager of Pebble Beach at the time. Uh, again, it resonates because it's Pebble Beach. It's an interesting place. Um, also interesting, beautiful model. This was for Mac Cosmetics. I shot in Vegas some time ago and then it ran in a, in a Mac uh, article in uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, again, better picture because she's interesting looking. Also, I should add Giselle, the artist I was working with, actually painted this this is body paint with Sikorsky crystals all over the body, but it's actually, she's, she's actually all body paint. Um, it's a fantastic project to work on. Skylines are interesting, beautiful cities, always fun to take pictures of. This was from a room um, in Tribeca, looking back up the city. Um, again, wherever you are, make something interesting out of it. This is interesting. This is the planetarium in Aiken. I put this image up. Uh, because this man told me I couldn't get this picture. Uh, I told him I wanted him to crank the planetarium up and he said, well, and I was supposed to there to do a portrait of him. And he said, well, you can't do that. Uh, lots of photographers have tried. And I said, he said, it'll take 30 minutes to, to crank this thing up. And I said, well, just, just do it for me, please. And he did. And uh, I took a grid, kept the light off the background and a long exposure and we got this portrait. Anyway, it's, interesting because of what it is and because of the light coming at the screen and because it's a planetarium and it's also because 
nobody else had at least had tried it in this facility had been able to pull it off. So I believe that brings me up. And then your morning commute. You know, Joe McNally also says, bad weather makes great pictures. So, you know, snow, wet ground, lights, um, always add to the interest of a picture. Always look for that picture that's, that's not expected. Um, and try to do something fun with that. Richard Avedon, this is my next quote, he always says, all pictures are accurate, none of them are the truth. And what I'm talking about here is, is editing the frame. You know how we talk about the media gives us a certain story based on what story they're trying to tell. And often that involves showing only part of the picture, or only part of the frame. Well, we can do the same thing with our photograph. You know, we don't, you know, we want to take a picture of our house, but we don't want, we want to edit out the things that would detract from the story we're trying to tell. For instance, this picture was in New York. This was at New York Public Library. It's a very, you know, solemn picture. It's a lonely picture. It's a, whatever it is. But the reality is right over downstairs and to the left uh, was a party going on. A uh, giant, giant party, hors d'oeuvres, the whole thing. But that wasn't the story that I wanted to tell with this picture. I wanted to tell the picture. And I actually was, was there uh, shooting pictures of the party and, and, and some, uh, some other jobs. But I swung on this man in the hallway and made this picture. And it's <laughs> one of my favorite from the weekend. This looks like morning, uh, and there was a lot of stuff going on around the room, but the focus for me here was, were the frames and her looking back over her artwork over the years. So I stuck a strobe out in the yard and, and edited the frame with light. Um, again, it's not, it's not the truth. It's, it's actual, it's factual, but it's not the whole story. It's not, it's been edited down. This was one of the, the uh, pictures from the, uh, human trafficking campaign. We shot this at the frying pan in New York. Uh, again, this is a factual shot, but it's not the whole story. These are actually actors, and this is actually a ship that hasn't sailed, and they actually pulled it up from the bottom of the ocean. And now it's uh, in the, I guess, New York Harbor and shot there for an entire day uh, to, to make this image. Um, but again, not the whole story, just the part of the story that we want to share. Again, another setup image, obviously, a lot less Photoshop here than you'd think. This was actually, this actually happened. Uh, I think I replaced one of the dog's heads. Uh, but obviously he doesn't show, uh, doesn't share dinner with his dogs like this every day. But it's just part of the story we wanted to tell about his relationship with his dogs. And this is a realtor in Aiken that I do a lot of work with, uh, David Stinson. But anyway, again, editing the frame, the kitchen's over here. We don't wanna show the kitchen. We wanna edit the frame. We wanna tell the story that we wanna tell. And we wanna add the elements that we want to, that, that improve the story or push forward the narrative that we wanna share in our photographs. Now, I need to introduce you at this point to my mentor, Jim Brady. I don't know if any of you guys have met him or knew him. He's, he's no longer with us, but he was a good friend for many years. He actually shot the, um, Marlboro Man campaign in the 60s and 70s and the Jack Daniels campaign in the 90s, that black and white campaign is famous. Um, he used to always say, and I'll back this up, if a shot's not working out for you, fog it. Basically what he was saying was you need to figure out how to see the light, how to, because what happens when you fog something, you put a particulate in the air and that allows you to see the beams of light. That, that's what happens with sunrises when you see the, the beams from the sun or that's what happens when you know, you're on a, fo a foggy a foggy morning, you see the, the beams coming through trees and things like that. That's what fogging allows you to do. And what it does is it helps us see where the light's coming from, how it's affecting our subject. And that's, that's a very important thing to be able to, to take note of. For instance, if you've ever been to India, I don't know if you've, any of you have ever been to India, but it's dusty. The entire country is dusty. Therefore, there's always particulate in the air and it always has this beautiful light almost, almost uh, the whole day. Uh, it's so dusty, um, which is maybe not the best environment to travel in. But it's a great environment to shoot in. So this was just down a, a dusty road in India. Um, again, just having that wonderful light come in behind this subject. Again, a foggy morning boat ride. Um, this was for uh, a community in Knoxville. 
uh, you see how the light comes in from the back of the frame and just, I always love the backlight things. I, I, people say that a lot. Um, but when it's diffused like this and nice, you give you a lot of flexibility, really wonderful. Um, sunrises are always easy to, to use uh, that diffuse light. Um, and then sometimes in the studio, you have to do it yourself. Uh, you know, fog machines work very well for that. Pick up a, a fog machine for $10 on the, on the after uh, Halloween sales. And uh, it can be a very effective way. You see how it helps you see the strobe light coming to the back of the subject uh, with all of the um, fog and, and light beams coming in there. Now, my subject here, this is David Stinson again. I've done a lot of shots with him. My subject was late. So I want to I want to acknowledge you can see how on the left of the frame you can see the light beam coming in the window. Well, it was supposed to hit him, but he was an hour late, so it doesn't hit him anymore. And the shot that I took of myself earlier, which was a setup shot, it was doing exactly what I wanted it to do. But you can't always expect your subject to be on time. So I still left the fog machine on. I still have this beam of light that that is nice, but not exactly what I wanted. But again, this is this shows how we use the uh, how we use the particulate, the fog, the whatever it is in the air to help you see the light come in. Now, this is a very important quote to me. Uh, a thing from Addie Leibowitz, who I'm sure you've all heard of. The thing that you see in my pictures is that I was not afraid to fall in love with these people, and I think that's one of the things that maybe differentiates me slightly. I really, really love people and I love what their experiences. One of my favorite things to shoot is people who make things because they seem like at the end of the day, a product exists that didn't exist when they started doing their work. And I feel like they're the most, um, they are the most, they seem the happiest to me when, when, when there's a product of their labor. Uh, Again, these are some shots of some of the subjects that I've shot. I'm just, I really try to connect with them. Um, and they connect back. And I think another great, great uh, quote is that a, a portrait is not taken, it's given. It's very much an exchange. I don't know if you noticed my logo at the first, on the first frame, but it's my cousin's painting of the word kiss. Uh, and, and in some degrees, a portrait is very much that intimate exchange. Uh, you give something, they give something back. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you just have to put them in the proper place and pull the trigger and you, you get what you get. But more often than not, it's a communication back and forth. And I think that's really what, what gives you the sense of a, a strong portrait. This is one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. Uh, this was the minute that Sheikh Youssef, a village leader in Somaliland, um, found out that his only son had cerebral palsy. And he was, of course, technically lit by this really wonderful door light coming across his face, kind of cross lit. And he cuts his eyes back to me because we had developed a relationship over the week that I'd been in his village. And it was, that was the exchange. Uh, he was getting bad news and, and I was there to commiserate with him. And anyway, that, that, that's why that shot ends up meaning so much to me. And it's a, it's a nice shot. Uh, again, moments, getting people to reflect, getting people to live their lives in front of you. And, uh, and you get to capture that, capture that little moment. Bankers. This was for a campaign for Bank South that we shot um, some years ago. But making her have the space to think about, giving her something to think about that was natural to her. Give her a natural kind of feel. Uh, act. Actresses and actors are generally better at it. You can kind of just direct them and they do what they're gonna do. This was in Italy. This was um, a great shoot uh, for a store there. Uh, this guy, if you know this guy, don't tell him that I showed you his picture. Um, he's a, but it's one of my favorites. It was kind of one of those, uh, how did I get here moments. This was in Italy, again, uh, in a Ferrari powered Fiat that his dad had owned. And we're blasting through the Italian countryside, and it's just a, just a great moment. I, I feel like it was, and it, it ended up being a nice portrait of him because he was enjoying his life, and I was out getting out of the way and letting him do that. Uh, Jesse Young, Jesse Colin Young, uh, great client, wonderful friend. 
uh, he does not like having his picture made. So I had him sing to his wife, who he loves very much. And there was this moment that happened when he's singing to his wife. Um, and so I, this was some years ago. I've shot for him ever since. Uh, again, falling in love with your subject, caring about your subject, empathizing with your subject. I think that goes a long way towards your photography. This was from Fashion Week. I'm not sure that I uh, cared much about her. I didn't even know her, but it was a nice shot. And I think I put, maybe put it in the wrong place in the slide. This was a friend of mine just sharing a moment and a true emotion, uh, making people laugh, connecting with them. A friend of mine with purpose tattooed on his chest. Again, people are all different. Um, so you can connect with them in different ways. Uh, this was in India. Uh, I was on the back of a motorcycle shooting this. It was not uh, in that traffic because that's the least traffic I actually saw there. So we, we lucked out there. Fun shoot. This was Somalia. Just beautiful, beautiful faces there. You may know her. Um, she is a wonderful, wonderful lady. And it's, it's she gets really natural when you let her be herself and care about, you know, connect and care about what she's creating because it's always fantastic and delicious as you know um but really really fun and then of course pork chop uh this was an idea that he actually had and it was just so well executed by some of the friends of mine at the studio i don't know that you could toss that paint again as perfectly as dusty did that day but it worked out really really well um but again somebody that i care very deeply for and always get a good portrait from him because we have a decent exchange of, uh, of reality. This subject I actually literally fell in love with. This is my wife. Um, so again, one of my favorite pictures of her, she, this was for Lionel Smith. They actually made a tux for her and subsequently we've done some shoots some handbag shoots with her as well, but a subject that I truly love. And I think it comes through in the picture. So I'll sort of wrap up with another story from my mentor about my uh, my ignorance, uh, which is a very easy thing to share about because it's no shortage of it. But we were in his studio one day and I, I was talking to him about the difference between an amateur and a professional photographer. And I was trying to get his perspective, him being Leo Burnett's right-hand photographer for decades and just an incredible, done an incredible body of work. But I asked him, I said, what's the difference between an amateur and professional photographer. And then of course I answered it because I thought I knew. And I said, I think it's lighting. I think it's when you understand lighting in the studio and you can do all these amazing things and you know, you're, you're able to, to create, you know, this look, this understanding strobes and all this stuff. And he looked at me and he said, do you know the difference between an amateur and professional photographer? And I said, well, I thought I did. I thought I just told you. He said, no, that's not it. And he asked, kept asking me over and over again. He said, do you know the difference between an amateur and professional photographer? I said, well, it's, 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 it's posing. It's, it's getting your, your, your subject to convey the emotion that you want. And he looked at me and he said, do you know the difference between an amateur and a professional photographer? And I said, well, I guess I still don't. And I said, well, maybe it's your clients. Like once you, you get certain, uh, a certain level of clientele, then you're considered professional because you know, you, you've shot for all over the world and done these brands and this, and, and that's when you become a professional photographer. And, and he said, do you know the difference between an amateur and a professional photographer? And I said, well, maybe it's, it's framing or it's, it's being able to shoot in these bad conditions and, you know, having the gear to, to shoot underwater, to shoot in the rain or to, to have, you know, the, the, the tools that you need to do, whatever your client asks you, you can do it. And he said, do you know the difference between an amateur and professional photographer? And I looked at him again, I was really confused. And I said, maybe it's color color theory, like understanding how colors work together or don't work together, or, you know, just understanding all of the nuances of, of, of an image and, and the rule of thirds and all of that stuff. And he looked at me and he said, do you know the difference between an amateur and professional photographer? I said, I guess I don't know. I mean, is, is it framing? Um, he looked at me and he said, no. Do you know the difference between amateur and professional photographer? I said, well, I guess I don't know. And he, he finally looked at me and he said, it's taste. It's a taste and taste is not 
defined by people outside of us. I mean, there is a level of taste, I guess. But I think in our photography, we would develop it for ourselves. We have the things we like. We have our level of taste that we appreciate. And at the end of the day, you know, I love shooting commercially. I really love shooting commercially, but there's nothing more fun to me than being on vacation with a camera that I don't normally shoot with and a lens I don't normally shoot with and creating something completely different because we get so, so like I, for me, photography is a service. A lot of the times, you know, they're hiring me for my professional knowledge, but they're also, they also have an, an expected outcome. And it's fun. I think when we get to be amateur photographers and we get to, to develop our own taste and our own photography, it's fun to have, to explore and to define ourselves through our photography. But I will say the most important thing is to have fun. And so that is all I have for you. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, I'm interested. I mean, I love photography and, um, you know, I have this uh, camera I bought, um, like a digital camera I bought when that first kind of, that whole craze kind of first came out. But now everybody's using their cell phone and you kind of talked about that and you said cell phones can take great pictures. And so I just kind of wanted, you know, just sort of verification about that. Should I be, I mean, do I need, do you think as somebody who loves photography, I need to get out that camera I bought and kind of learn more about it? Or do you think just using my cell phone is good enough? I think it depends on what you want to produce. There's certainly lenses. Uh, the new iPhone, which I just got, uh, is, is phenomenal. But there, there's depth of field that you can't necessarily create with the, well, I guess you can with the long lens now, but there, there are lenses and there are things that a camera still does. It still creates, it's still got a larger sensor. It's going to create a higher end image. Like if you want to do prints, things like that, um, I think the camera is fun to play with. And I think the other thing about the camera is if you want to learn photography and you want to change your f-stop and you want to change your shutter speed and you want to do things that are creative, that's not as, as accessible on the, on the camera, on the phone, as it is the camera. So it depends on what level you want to do photography. If you want snapshots of your family, cool landscapes of your trips, cameras, the iPhone is kind of hard to beat, really. I mean, it's a phenomenal camera. Um, but if you are into photography, and I don't mean to differentiate it that way, but if you're into photography and you want to play with depth of field, you want to play with external lighting, although Profoto, the strobes that I use, they just came out with a, stove, a, a light just for the iPhone. Uh, so it's coming and it's, it is a, is a tool that a lot of people use for their photography. Um, I can't really say one way or the other as far as telling you what you should do, but I can tell you that, that they still, even though they do, iPhones do wonderful photography, it's, it, it's a different style. It's less mm -hmm. control, it's more, it's very accessible, but it's not as, it doesn't give, like I couldn't shoot a campaign with it because it doesn't give me the tools that I need to um, create images that can be reproduced large or um, it's not fast enough in a lot of cases to do a lot of things that I need to do with the camera. Um, but it is, it's, it is great. It's hard to say. Like, if, if, what are you shooting? I guess you'd ask, what do you, what kind of stuff do you love to shoot? Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I mean, just, I mean, I've kind of gotten out of the swing of it with all this pandemic going on. I need to be yeah. doing more of stuff like that. Like I used to take pictures all the time at events and, that kind of stuff of people and just scenery. I mean, I want to do more of that. I want to get back into doing more of that. And I just wonder if the, if the cell, and I, I really appreciate what everything you said, but I wonder if maybe, maybe I should just start with my phone. And like, like you're saying, and that ha does have everything. And I just need to kind of get used to doing all that again. Does it, is it hard to print photos from your phone? Like, yeah, is there a certain. If you've got a Wi-Fi printer, you can, um, you can print them from your phone. Okay. Wi-Fi printer. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times, I don't know how well they would print, but I can't tell you how many times I've been shooting an event uh, and had somebody with an iPhone right next to me take a picture that I wish I had taken. And it happens more often than I'd like to admit. Um, 
can't, you know, it, it's, it's lower light. It's not lit with your little strobe like you have. There's some differences, but God, they do, they do take wonderful pictures. So um, I would start there. And then if there's something that the, the phone's not giving you, know that you have a camera as a backup. I hope that's not blasphemy what I just said. I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, that um, it's, it's, I'm not saying I could shoot with it. I'm not saying, but I'm saying right. for a lot of people, it's really a wonderful option. Well, the camera on the phone definitely makes it easier since you're always going to have your phone. It's easier to make sure you have it in the, in the heat, in the heat of the moment at an event that you want to take a picture of. Right. It's it, again, the best camera in the world is the one you have with you and the one you'll use. You know, if you have a giant Nikon with a wonderful lens, but you never pull it out. Like I have RZ 67s that I love, I love those cameras, but I never have them with me because they're a pain in the butt to shoot with. So, you know, how effective are they? I don't know. I have them, but I, I only use them when I'm on vacation. Does that make hey, any Brett, sense um, a question from the chat is um, Jeff Aston wants to know what your name tag says. He's been trying to read it uh, in Ukraine. It says contractor Brent Klein marketing. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a COVID. Um, I had to get screened for COVID to come on the shoot today. So I'm, I, I don't know if I told everybody I'm actually on a shoot right now. So uh, I'll wrap up in just a little bit and go down and finish up this shoot today. But um, what an honor to speak with all of you. Is there, are there any more questions? I can shift my badge. <laughs> Man, what's, what's the most, what's the most dangerous place you've, you've shot? Probably Pakistan. I, the whole time I was in Pakistan, I, I had in the back of my mind, things would happen. I would like, oh, this is how I die. Oh, so this is how I die. Oh, so, th so there's this 300 pound man that wanted to give me a massage and he proceeds to walk on my back. And I was like, oh, so this is how I die. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was, and there was a lot of anti-American flags up when I was there. And then, you know, a guy with two machine guns on his chest ripped a door open to the car I was in and said, you know, oh, I was an American. And they all ran over and you know, I was, I was 25 feet in front of uh, the largest Taliban mosque in Karachi. Like, it was, that was probably the most dangerous one I've been on. Right. I wanted to share something with you guys. This is from a few years ago. <laughs> Brent actually shot a video. Um, not a video, but um, a ton of pictures for an event that I was doing. We had such a good time. That was a good time. Always it was. To work with you. Thank you. Same here. I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Any other questions? I know Brent has to get back to work taking wonderful photographs, but any other last minute questions? Okay, well, I do want everyone to know that we will be meeting next Monday. We're veering off of our every other um, week uh, so that we can get in two meetings in December. So our speaker next week will be Dr. Hubert Von Toole from Augusta University. He's gonna to speak to us on Pearl Harbor because that is December 7th. Um, and then um, our next meeting will be December 21st. Then we'll take two weeks off for Christmas and New Year's and resume our biweekly meetings on January 11th. Um, I want to end our meeting, first of all, to thank Brent. Um, that was a wonderful presentation and wonderful um, photographs. Um, I actually have a quote um, about photography that I found that I wanted to share. So it kind of fits in well with your presentation. This is actually from an American novelist, Eudora Weltley, and she says, a good snapshot keeps a moment from running away. So I thought it was very good. Oh, nice. And we all need to make sure that we're capturing the important moments in our lives before they're gone. So thank you so much, Brent. Um, have a good Thank shoot. You. Everyone have a great week. Um, don't forget um, to donate to the Charitable Trust. And I hope to see everyone back um, next week, December 7th. And congratulations to Jeff Drake on the attendance prize. Thanks again, Brent. Have a great day. Thank you. Good day.